Hello and welcome back to the Beyond the Seams podcast. I'm Molly Elizabeth Agnew, founder of Eternal Goddess. And today I'm talking to 16th century historian Katie Marshall, all about Elizabeth I's relationship with fashion and her clothes, what happened to them, and the Bacton altar cloth. It's going to be an interesting episode, so I do hope you enjoy. If you want to keep up to date with future episodes and more from Eternal Goddess, make sure you're following us on Instagram. Thank you for joining us. Um, so actually, I thought we could start um, by maybe you could talk a little bit about who you are, okay. what you do as a historian, your interest in 16th century. Um, well, my name's Katie Marshall. Um, I'm at Katie History on Twitter and Instagram, um, and I mainly focus around 16th century and 17th century um, history. Um, Mary Queen of Scots is my kind of area. Um, I'm really passionate about, you know, to do with her life and all the implications mm. that has. Um, and I've been on uh, Talking Tudors podcast. And I also run my own blog, um, Katie's Chronicles, which I write about different events and people in history that interest me. Um, sort of the long 16th century, but I've also done um, something on the Nuremberg Chronicles, which kind of went out for a bit. But it's interesting to, you know, to to get out of your area sometime and learn something new yourself. So, um, yeah, that's me, sort of my history side. And I'm also um, a classical soprano as well. So that's kind of my alter ego, if you like. Um, I'm an ambassador for the Prince's Trust and I performed around the country. Um, and I like to, um, you know, combine my, my history interest and my music interest as much as I can. So I sing a lot of 16th century music. She's very oh, good at you. it. Um, <laughs> so I thought... If we're going to talk about Queen Elizabeth I and fashion and the importance of that, um, I mean, I, ha I have a baseline sort of knowledge about this stuff because I am a Tudor. <laughs> Bath, the Tudors, is my specific time period of choice. And Berlin is my uh, figure of choice. She captures a lot of people's um, imagination. <laughs> she does. She does indeed. Um, but something that I feel like not many people are aware of are sumptuary mm. laws and specifically Elizabethan sumptuary laws. Um, so... Can you explain a little bit about what those are and how they relate to Well, they're fashion? really interesting, really. They, they were a set of laws um, that ran from the medieval period up into the late Tudors and into Elizabeth's reign. And they were basically a set of laws that attempted to uh, regulate and control the clothes, um, so the colours and the fabrics that people were permitted to wear based on their social standing and their yearly income so it was, it was codified in law and it was broken down so um, you knew basically um, if someone was following these laws by looking at them where they sort of fit into society so it's quite useful in that way um, but it was particularly concerned with the really rich and sumptuous um, kind of where the name comes with sumptuary laws mm -hmm. um, fabrics like cloth of gold and cloth of silver which were basically material with the uh, metal thread um, sewn into them. So they're really um, very costly material. And these were um, just for the immediate members of the royal family or an earl, which is the um, top end of the aristocracy. Um, so there were things like you could only wear blue and red velvet if you were a knight, um, a duke or a baron. Um, and obviously for us now, they're extremely useful for identifying material and um, seeing who might have worn it. Um, but there are lots of reasons that they felt they needed to bring in these laws. I mean, Henry VIII had a few, but it really came to prominence during Elizabeth I's reign. And she was the first, actually, to bring in sumptuary law for women as well. So with a queen on the throne, she had to be extra careful that she wasn't outdone in her fashion. Um, and she issued um, in excess of eight proclamations on the excess of apparel, um, especially in her later oh. years. And I think it, it kind of reflects this changing um, social mobility, you know, the merchant classes, they were living in style, they were becoming more and more prosperous. And there was this innate fear that there might be confusion and disorder if people started dressing and almost shape shifting through their clothes into another um, you know, climbing the social ladder in that way. They weren't implemented as strictly as, you know, they might have liked. So it did depend on somebody, you know, like your neighbour going to the authorities and saying, oh, they're wearing velvet. They shouldn't be wearing that. And um, or if you turned up to court and you might be laughed at for, you know, dressing above your status. But uh, there are a couple examples of people being imprisoned if they were sort of higher up and, you know, it was more threatening um, but it was also a sort of an economic thing as well. So it encouraged people to, I guess, shop local and use um, English materials and, you know, Welsh materials like wool. Um, so it protected local industry in that way as well and stopped people importing, you know, silk and fur from Spain or Italy. 
Um, so there are a lot of layers to it, but I'm not sure it was implemented with the, um, the stringency that they would have liked. So obviously fashion is important to every reigning monarch, especially a female reigning monarch. Um, but why specifically do you think it was so important to Elizabeth, uh, both in terms of these sumptuary laws and um, putting reins on what people could and couldn't do, um, but how she used fashion to portray uh, her strength and her emotions and mm. her as a monarch? I think yeah, particularly for Elizabeth, you know, it's so impactful seeing her portraits. We can see how important fashion was to her. And we sometimes think of it as like a side to the, the politics of the Tudor era, but really it was so important for how people viewed their monarch. Um, so the magnific magnificence of a monarch's dress sort of validated their right to rule, really. Um, when uh, visiting ambassadors would come to England, Elizabeth would make sure that she dressed to full glory and she showed off her jewels that had been gifted to her. And this was sort of reflecting the state of the realm. Um, it was a way for people to gauge the stability. So if the monarch, sort of, people know about Elizabeth's mask of youth in her later years, if the monarch looked eternally youthful, they saw that the country was you know, stable and it wasn't decaying. It was still this superpower. Um, and as you say, um, for Elizabeth as a woman, this is especially important because she had to find new expressions for her power and how to use it. Um, and I think she did use it in a sort of feminine way, but she wasn't afraid to adopt sort of clothing that hinted at more masculine styles. Um, so there's this mm. portrait from the 1570s that shows Elizabeth wearing a bodice, um, but it, it's fastened down the front rather than from the side or the back, which sort of resembles a, a man's doublet. So, um, mm. you know, it's giving her this physical presence. She wasn't afraid to to be sort of uh, more um, sort of genderless when it suited her. And mm. I think, you know, a few queens of this period and before did this, um, Eleanor of Aquitaine um, sort of wore men's clothing to allow her to ride astride. So, <laughs> um, you know, it got her a lot of critics, but I think, you know, she was really successful. And we see this in her portraits. I mean, my personal favourite mm. is the rainbow portrait from 1600. <laughs> yeah. But, you, you know, it's so impactful. And, you know, she's holding the rainbow. That's why it's called the rainbow portrait. She's saying that without the sun, there can't be a rainbow. And Elizabeth is putting herself forward as the sun. Without her, there can't be peace. She's this all divine, uh, powerful be being with sort of mastery over celestial powers. It's really sort of impactful. And, you know, that appeal hasn't really gone away for us. We're still, we still feel something when we look at it. Well, it's an altar cloth. Um, of course, it's called an altar cloth because it, it was used in St Faith's Church in the small rural village of Bacton in Herefordshire. And that's why it's got this sort of T shape because <laughs> um, it, it would have been used as an altar cloth. But um, it's now believed that it's uh, the only survivor of Elizabeth I's wardrobe. So can you explain a little bit about what the Bacton altar cloth looks like for those on the podcast who can't see a visual? Well, it's a cream coloured silk. It's very beautiful um, and it's decorated with elaborate um, floral uh, patterns and natural motifs that were extremely fashionable in the late Elizabethan period. Um, and we can date it from the 1590s because of these very cute little strawberries, mistletoe, stems and, you know, a few creatures like um, caterpillars and deer because... Um, during the Stuart period, um, at the turn of the Stuart period, they favoured more kind of entwining vines with that kind of Scottish influence. So that's how mm. we can date it. And it's because of the, the provenance, really, that we can say almost certainly that it belonged to Elizabeth I because um, of the connection to Blanche Parry, who was the devoted um, servant of Elizabeth I. She worked in her privy chamber. She was keeper of her jewels. She never married or had any children and she was in Elizabeth's service for 57 years, so it's longer than anyone else. Um, and every, Elizabeth sort of measured all her other um, ladies against Blanche um, because she was, you know, she's just perfect for her, really. Um, so she was extremely mm. honoured to have received um, this as a gift and it's believed that either this belonged to Blanche or it was given by Elizabeth to um, the Bacton Parish after she died. 
so do we do we have an idea um because obviously it's in the shape of an altar mm. cloth so it must have been huh, altered um do we have any idea whether uh what 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 this piece of fabric would have been used for what what kind of garment um it would have originally belonged to well um you know it was noted by a few researchers it was obviously very um sacred to the parish because they put it on display um rather than continuing to use it as an altar cloth um, so it's noted by a few researchers, but it wasn't until um, Larry Lynn, who's the fashion and textile creator at Historic Royal Palaces, um, was doing some research for her own book and she visited it um, at Backton and she noted that it was made of still silver thread. Um, so it's cloth of silver. So we know from the sumptuary laws that this would have been for immediate members of the royal family. So you know it was the royal family was quite diminished by the end of elizabeth's reign of course she had no children of her own so we can almost certainly say that it was elizabeth's um the part of a dress belonging to elizabeth because there's evidence of fabric uh, a cutting pattern so it's obviously been part of a large garment or a skirt panel um so yeah, it's it's very exciting because obviously all these garments were normally re repurposed because of how precious they were. You couldn't, there was no disposable fashion. You always had to make something new of these precious materials because they were just too expensive to to you know, go to the back of your wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. So from the inventory of at Elizabeth's death, um, it's recorded that she owned over two thousand items of clothing in her wardrobe. Um, so, you know, you think that there, some of them would have survived, but as you say, there are many reasons why this isn't the case, especially for the royal dress collection. Um, but luckily we've got Holbein, you know, we can see um, what they what they would have looked like. Um, but Elizabeth was um, sort of famously frugal. She would have these dresses remodelled. They were sort of modular, so a lot of them would have detachable sleeves so you could create a new outfit. Um, you didn't have to stay it as one dress and you could give the illusion of your wardrobe being much larger than it actually was um, and give these pieces a new lease of life, really. Um, and But after Elizabeth's death we, death, we know that Anna of Denmark, who was James I's wife, um, she went through the wardrobe and she refashioned a lot of them into the Stuart style. So there wasn't kind of this reverence that we pop we would have you know they they made use of them they weren't going to you know keep it as elizabeth's dress you know if these dresses had survived um or the re the gifting and the repurposing of them there are lots of other um jumps that they had to go over to to survive for us today so there's the civil war when oliver cromwell's forces were trying to eradicate any item with connection to royalty so um we lost, obviously, a lot of the crown jewels um, because of this. So it's, it mm. seems plausible that we would have lost quite a lot of um, Tudor fabric as well. Um, but if they had survived that, then, um, as you say, the Great Fire of London in 1666, a lot of the, um, the dresses in the royal wardrobe were stored um, in the city of London. Um, the area is still called the wardrobe. St Andrew's by the wardrobe is the church, um, denoting that that mm. area. Um, so that would have, you know, destroyed an awful lot. We can't really say how much. Um, but on top of that, you've also got the, the fire at the Palace of Whitehall in 1698. So they had a lot to contend with. <laughs> so you can see why, um, you know, we haven't got very much at all. And if some have survived, then the provenance is lost, really. They're probably in a stately home somewhere made into a cushion. Um, well, I think it was on loan from Bacton, and I think it was um, 2019-2020 it was put on display at Hampton Court, where it could have been worn by Elizabeth, which is quite special, so it was kind of going home for a bit. But it was taken there to be restored. Um, they had to freeze it to eradicate any pests, and they also removed it from the frame and changed the woolen back and backing to a silk one to stop any further pulling or distortion of the images. So they, can, they uh, you know, it was put into expert you know to preserve it um but i think that maybe it's been returned to backton i mean there hasn't been much talk but i'm hoping that it will go back on display again um it was put on display next to the rainbow portrait um at hampton court because it's got such a resemblance to it so there's this idea that it, it's very similar <laughs> so you know it i'm sure people you know looking at these two next to each other there were shivers um, down a lot of spines looking at this because you know those those floral patterns are quite distinctive yeah so it's difficult to say um, whether the items we see in portraits um, they're the ones we know might have existed but it's hard to say whether how much 
artistic license there is there. Um, but obviously I, I love that, um, the material used in the rainbow portrait, um, if it really existed. <laughs> um, but, you know, another item I love, and luckily we do have this, so um, I don't know if I'd really need to help by bringing it back, but the checkers ring, um, you know, is just yeah. exquisite. Yeah. Um, with, you know, the yeah. mother of pearl. And that I saw it um, when it recently went on exhibition earlier this year at the British Library. Um, and those glistening rubies, you can't see it in a photograph so well, but they really are just stunningly sparkly, um, you know, and it's diamonds. And of course, it opens to reveal those two portraits and it's so personal to Elizabeth. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I don't know. It's hard to say, but, you know, I think that we're really, really lucky to have that. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Have you got something? <laughs> oh, oh, have I got something? Well, I said I'd probably be boring and like take a shift or something because mm. it's a really personal item. But then I'd feel a little bit creepy because that feels a little bit too personal. So maybe something from her younger mm. years. Um, maybe when she was a teenager, yeah. a gown or coronation robes. Yes, because those yes. are not the sort of things that that, that stick around mm. because Oliver yeah, Cromwell. That's a good point. Um, yeah. So I think I'd like a coronation yeah. robes, Good actually. Because they're very personal and a one-off. Yeah. And not like anything we ever have. Anyway, that's never going to happen. I wish. Yeah. If time travel ever becomes a thing, maybe. Thank you very Thank much you. Uh, for joining me. Where can people find you online? Uh, well, I'm at Katie History on Twitter and on Instagram. Mainly on Twitter, but you know, my Instagram's slightly newer. Um, I'm also um, been on a couple of podcasts. Um, yeah, and my um, history is connect connected to my music Twitter, so you can have a look at both. And I'm also, um, my blog is Katie Chronicles. Thank you for listening to the Beyond the Seams podcast. I do hope you enjoyed. If you'd like to keep up to date with future episodes and more from Eternal Goddess, make sure you're following us on Instagram. <laughs>